There is no price too high to pay to feel complete alignment with yourself. There's no price too high to have that sense of self-respect, self-value at the deepest level. There's nothing too tempting to overcome. There's nothing too difficult to attempt to integrate or achieve. It's because everything in life, every result, every positive thing that we want flows from a core integrity that cannot be bought. It cannot even be forged or built contrary to what might be the prevailing thought of the day when it comes to personal development work. It cannot be bought, it cannot be forged, it cannot be sought in the external world. It can only be revealed. It can only be revealed. That holy grail feeling of oneness with yourself is ultimately revealed. That is to say, it is already you. You are already self-respect, self-esteem, love, confidence, groundedness, calm, relaxation. That is actually the core you. And so in this sense, all of those words are really just semantics for saying coming home to you. And that self-respect, it's demonstrating this at-homeness that we're all after. We all want to come home to ourselves, right? But it's very easy to forget that we are essentially already who we want to be. There are just things that we have on top of that that make us forget it, that have this kind of amnesia around us, make us have that feeling. And that's what we're looking at here. Another way of looking at it is that we are all like lakes. We're all like mountain lakes and the really sublime, pristine, clear mountain lake where you can see all the way down to the bottom is what we're after. We're trying to distill away and let the dirt and cloudy sediment basically be filtered out or come to rest so that we can clearly see ourselves all the way to the bottom. It's another way of saying who we are, who we feel ourselves to be, who other people see us as, how we identify. It's all the same. It all lines up. It's all clear. That's what we want, right? So, okay, how do we do it? How do we get there? What I've seen is we need to identify and embrace discomfort. It's really a willingness to look at all of this stuff that clouds us up and slow down into it and play the game over as long as it takes in a gentle, self-compassionate way, knowing that you are already that which you want to be, so there's no need to rush or get intense about it, slowing down into playing this long game of growth, essentially. And in that playing the long game, we have discomfort to face. So one of the great first steps to look at <laughs> is to, uh, seems like there's a cat out there, enduring some discomfort. One of the first things to look at is where are we enduring compromise? Where are we tolerating? Where are we accepting halfway measures? Where are we feeling awkward, feeling in between, feeling a split somatically, feeling uncertainty, all of this kind of things could be better or I'm tolerating like a, you know, like six, seven out of 10 in life and really slowing down into this and creating an inventory. I like to call this the mediocrity mirror and I'll get more into how to do that as we go along in this video. But it's actually quite simple. We just need to be able to create that time and self-contain enough to slow down and take that inventory. Where am I out of integrity? Where am I accepting and tolerating these things that I know I could be more in alignment with, that I could be more clear with, that are actually not full expressions of who I am? Where am I allowing that? 
That's like your first step and it's going to be uncomfortable. And then the second is what do I need to do to begin to bring that back into integrity, into alignment, right? Some may see this all as too high a price, but we know better because we know that there really is no price too high to pay to get to that feeling where we're in alignment and things feel right on a nervous system level, on a deep psychological level when you wake up in the middle of the night and you just have a random thought about who am I? Oh yeah, I'm this person. And then you feel it's okay. It's good. I'm good with, I'm good with me, right? That's what this is all about. That is the pearl of great price. That is the pearl of impossible price. You can't put a price on that feeling of rightness in yourself. So if it involves a bit of discomfort, we're going to be willing to pay that, right? And this comes through in a lot of other ways that you might already be doing that we can use to help you kind of slow down into this process. I like to think of uh, a an arbitrage between discomfort and then what we get on the other side. So basically, a return on investment, an arbitrage, maybe depending on the activity from 1 to 10 or 1 to 100, 1 to 1,000. And what I mean by that, for example, is if you're a person like me who sees clients, you need to be in a certain frame of mind, a certain body state, a certain calmness to be able to show up and be with people and help them and basically be an empty vessel. And in order to get to that, which is a form of aliveness with a capital A, you need to be able to change your state. Now, at the beginning of whenever we change state, there's inertia that we need to overcome. And that is interpreted as a sensation of discomfort. And I like to say this is a discomfort tax that we have to pay to get the aliveness, to harvest the aliveness on the other side. And so going to the gym before I see clients is like a one to a hundred arbitrage because I pay this little, I pay this little tax of discomfort, you know, starting off cold, maybe some muscles are sore, maybe I'm just tired, I don't really want to be here today. But what I get in return after, especially I've actually got into the workout, is a lot more aliveness, a lot more focus, energy. And I am actually touching in back to who I actually am. So I'm paying that small price, that small tax, paying down my discomfort tax to harvest my my high ROI aliveness arbitrage. Now it's all like kind of a silly way of framing it. It's kind of nerdy actually, but it helps me to frame th- why it's worth it because I'm after aliveness. Aliveness is the juice of life. It's the it's the main thing because aliveness again is who you are. Aliveness is linked to that self-respect, self-value conversation that we started the video off with right? So, okay. So we need to find these places where we can pay down discomfort taxes, harvest the aliveness, and then do that more and more so that we have a frame for being able to look at the deep stuff, right? So if you are already willingly paying down a li- uh, discomfort taxes to harvest aliveness. That is something that you can use for doing this inner work, for slowing down and doing the inventory that I'm calling the mediocrity mirror, right? Which we'll get into. So some people are not willing to pay down these taxes, however, and sometimes in the past I would ask why, why not, right? And it's because they are unwilling and under that unwillingness is the fact that they don't value themselves enough to see that the price, whatever that price is, that discomfort tax is going to be fully worth it and then pay it. They don't connect the two. 
they don't see the aliveness on the other side. They don't see the integrity, the self-respect, the self-valuing that would come from paying down the tax, right? And why do they feel that they can't do that? It's because they do not actually have that connection to the self-value, right? Why not? Because usually of trauma or attachment wounds, shame, belief systems, deprogramming that we need to do, right? It's the stuff. It's the stuff that we're looking at. A thing can be so obvious to do, a price so minuscule compared to the reward, but if a person does not value themselves, they cannot see their value as an embodied somatic knowing. They don't have that experience. They will avoid paying down their discomfort taxes to get the aliveness. They will do anything they can to avoid paying it because paying it would mean that they actually did value themselves. And that would be to go against the story that they've been living out. It's usually unconscious, but that is basically saying, I am unworthy of feeling good and of feeling alive. Right. And so that's like two, two different stories com competing in the psyche. One is, all right, I know that in order to get aliveness and to feel more of this embodied sense, I have to pay down these initial discomfort taxes. If you value yourself, you'll do that. If you don't value yourself because of this stuff, then you can't actually see it, even if it's completely obvious to you, right? So we need another way in there. And that is to come back to this inventory again. So it's a different kind of price. It's still discomfort, but essentially it's the discomfort that underlies all of the things that allow for aliveness to come. And that's again, to come back to this mediocrity mirror. So for me, integrity does not compute with mediocrity. Mediocrity does not compute with self-love and self-respect. Mediocrity is not the real me. So this mediocrity mirror is meant to show me where I am unconsciously, habitually not being the real me and to feel the real pain and discomfort of that, the unacceptability of that. So maybe you might not call it the mediocrity mirror. You might call it the integrity mirror, or I could love myself better mirror. But basically, like we said at the beginning, where do I need to look? I need to see where I'm accepting half measures tolerating mediocrity, avoiding discomfort, avoiding awkwardness, escaping from reality. I need to see where I am not in integrity. Where am I being less than truthful? Where am I acting dishonestly, lying to myself, maneuvering behind the scenes, being two people at once, enduring a split somatically, mentally, harboring guilt or shame? Where am I running away? Right? This is confronting stuff to look at. It's very confronting but it's meant to force you to face where you are not living up to these deeper standards. And those deeper standards, again, like we said at the beginning, they are you. The deeper standards are not there for no reason. The standard of I work out regularly and feel that aliveness, that standard is actually a form of self-love that's coming from who you have always been, right? And so the mediocrity mirror is meant to show you where you are not living up to that standard or um, have been living out some other standard as a result of the stuff that's clouding the mountain lake, right? So you need to make a list of everything that you do that's causing this split within you. And see these two competing realities, the, the split, and begin to amplify it. That's what we're doing with this. We want to blow up this feeling of the split, of there being like, whoa, there's the real me 
who would not be accepting and tolerating all these things. And then there's the other me or the non-real me that I have been living. So the way I like to do this, I've sort of laid it out, but I want to get even more granular with you. The way I like to do this is actually to get out a pen of paper or go on your notion or your word document or whatever, and just start writing a bunch of sentences that begin with either it's okay to, or it's okay that I, right? So some examples, it's okay to have friends who never listen to me, who don't inspire me, who drag me down and steal my energy. It's okay to skip workouts. It's okay to check my email a thousand times a day. It's okay to hate my job and complain about it and never do anything about it. It's okay to escape the negative feelings I have about my job with weed or video games or entertainment or Netflix. It's okay to keep complaining about the same thing to all of my friends and have my relationships be dominated by that complaint energy. It's okay to blame my parents for why X or Y did not work out. It's okay to never have money. It's okay to wear hand-me-down clothes. It's okay to shop at thrift stores. We're getting into some confronting stuff, right? It's okay to wake up late. It's okay to check my phone all the time. It's okay to never have fun in life, etc. So the goal is not to become militant. It's not to activate your nervous system. It's not to become like super against yourself. It's not to create this negativity. It's to just step into truth and to begin to take detached, calm inventory. And uh, in the letter that came out the week that I filmed this, where I talk about the inner father, which will be the next video, I talk about how you need this archetype, which I call the inner father, to be able to contain and hold this exercise. Because if you can't contain yourself, if you can't just step into a detached, objective, loving, kind, but very forthright part of yourself, which I identify with as a kind of mature masculine side, then this exercise will be just self-flagellation. It will just create a bunch of bad feelings that you can't do anything with, right? So you do need to be somewhat self-contained or to have somebody who you trust do this with you so that you feel contained. But essentially what you're trying to do is just get to that place where you can see the truth of your life and create a kind of blue flame, like a cold anger, because that cold anger simply says, I cannot accept this. I cannot keep doing this. It's not okay. You said it was okay a bunch of times. It's actually not okay. This is, this is bullshit. I'm not going to continue to tolerate and accept this mediocrity because I am way more than this, right? It's unacceptable. It's a no more place. And that is a very good feeling to have if you can understand the nuance, because it is not a place where you are going to tip either into shutdown, into your dorsal vagal, where it just is too much. It's too much to take. I got to numb out from this truth. And it's not to go into this more activated, sympathetic, intense hero energy where I'm going to burn everything down now and take crazy action, right? It's to stay in the middle. That's really the only sustainable way to make a change in your life. You have to first have the truth serum conversation and then be able to call up the inner father, the inner good father, and go through this process wherein he lights that blue flame under your ass and shows you that it's not okay, right? And you inhabit that place as well when you start to take the next step, which we'll get into here in a bit. But just to spend a little bit more on this inner good father and what I would see as the dichotomy that the inner good father can have in the psyche 
with, like when we don't have the inner father, oftentimes what fills that void is what I would look at as the dark mother. And that is a energy that seeks to soothe and numb and take care and say it's okay. It's a way of protecting these wounds. You can also have shame in there too. I don't know if I would necessarily maybe call that a part of the dark mother, but shame can be this blanket that keeps us from really going in underneath. It's very protective. So all these coping strategies, right, can come out of the dark mother. And that ultimately just perpetuates it. So a part of this process is to build up the inner good father, which is a combination of truth and courage and love. It's a hard-edged, solemn, stern, realistic, but loving energy that allows you to look in the mirror of mediocrity and maybe even laugh about it and see like, wow, look at all these ways that I've been saying it's okay for me essentially to be out of integrity and out of alignment with the core being that I am, that I've been that I've been talking about here as being where self-respect lives and is. Self-respect, self-love, self-value, that's where it lives, right? So you can imagine that as you create your mediocrity mirror, as you go through this kind of exercise, you are actually strengthening and bringing into conscious awareness an inner being, this inner being, who is able to hold all of this truth, and that is the inner good father, right? And so, okay, we'll talk about that more next week. What the inner good father sees, though, is that it's not a problem with you, with a capital Y you. It's a problem with what has been put on top of you. And he helps you to see that, and then he helps you to take the next step, which is really to say, how would I instead prove that I did value myself? How would I come back into alignment? How would I demonstrate that staying in integrity with myself was actually of the highest importance? How would I change all of this? It's okaying if I actually did value myself, if I actually did feel that I was worthy of feeling this aliveness, how would I lean into discomfort to come back into integrity if I really did value myself? And so you can start to ask these types of questions. You can start to ask these other ones as well. For example, if I really valued and loved my deepest self, then I would do this differently. I would start coming back into integrity in this way. I would stop doing this. I would no longer believe. I would no longer hang out with. I would cut away. I would go toward. If I really saw myself as completely whole and worthy already, I would no longer justify. I would dress this way instead. I would take care of this. I would square away that. You can start to see how this process requires you to slow down, but also is not about beating yourself up for being out of integrity. It's about seeing, actually, that's an opportunity to value myself and to prove that value of myself, right? To really say, if I loved myself deeply, then that would mean I would change this, or I would get support with that, or I would be involved with this, or I would go to there. You have to see it as a self-valuing conversation, right? We prove this self-value, we prove our connection and our awareness of our real deep self by taking this kind of action. That's another thing that the inner good father will help you to do, right? And he will help you to see that any price that needs to be paid, any discomfort tax that needs to be paid down, it's whatever, because what you get, which again is this self-respect, this self-love, it's invaluable, it's, it's worth any price, right? It's not only just for yourself to 
end on a more global cosmic note. It's not just for yourself that you go through this process of identifying where you're out of integrity, identifying it as a fundamental kind of disconnect from your real being who has always been good, who has always been valued and loved. It's not just to go through that for yourself. It's because when you do that, you begin to come into a place where there's so much aliveness and willingness and energy that you begin to share that naturally. And that turns into aligned service, right? Which is why this inner work, this road opening is so important at this moment. We're all doing this in some way. We're all trying to, as the saying goes, help each other find home, walk each other home, right? But we're doing that, I feel, because it's sort of the time to do that. It's the time to come back into into this absolute knowing and understanding that we have always been good and already that which we want to be and yearn to be, but that we have to move through and help each other to remember that. And that involves this willingness to go into discomfort, seeing it as a very small price to pay because what's on the other end is our integrity and our love and our energy, right? So that's it for today. Hope that made sense. Let me know. And uh, yeah, I'll be back next week to talk about the inner father, how we can expand on that archetype to strengthen even more this sense of willing, loving, stark, detached, strong energy, which allows us to do this type of self-confrontation, essentially. So until then, bye for now.